welcome to the sudden and welcome to this small session about platforms. Everybody knows what platforms are. I'm sure that you all use them. I mean, um, Facebook, do you know that? Yes. <laughs> and then WhatsApp and all these kind of things. But this is platforms. It's the new world that is coming. It's how industries are developing from pipelines to platforms. So today we're going to see a little bit what platforms are, what platforms are about. So let's start. Who knows who is the world's largest taxi company or transportation company nowadays? Come on. Uber. Uber, great. Uh, Uber started only in 2009. It was in San Francisco, and in five years, it got 20, well, 50 billions. Now operates in most of the cities, in 200 cities. Well, not here, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully soon, but in 200 cities. And how many taxis do they have? Zero. Wow. That's not much, no? And who is the world's most popular media owner? Here we can have some conflicts, but anybody? Come on. You have a guess, I'm sure. A Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. And how that's, that's Facebook. 1.5 billion subscribers. More than 40 billion in annual revenue in advertisement in 2015. And this year, they top it. They just top it. And how many pieces Facebook creates? Zero again. Wow. Yeah. And which is the worst, most valuable retailer? Here, we, I'm sure we have some discussion. Uh, no, that's right. Come on. <laughs> Alibaba. Yeah. <laughs> uh, almost. <laughs> almost. Almost there. One billion different products only in Taobao. That is only one small site of Alibaba. It's not all Alibaba. Only a small site of Alibaba. Uh, that's similar to eBay. And well, the economy says the biggest bazaar and this kind of thing. And how much inventory does Alibaba has? So, yeah. Amazon has some, but Alibaba, no way. And we still have another one that everybody knows. Airbnb. Airbnb. <laughs> Absolutely. 119 countries, more than half a million properties, uh, 10 million guests. By sounding funding, that was April 12, 2004, more than $10 billion. That's quite a lot. These companies, if you look at them, they all have in common this zero number. We're going to see lots of zeros today. And this is a huge change in the way how companies manage and how companies make money, how companies profit. Let's examine a little bit this, this way. About platforms. We're going to see only three things. It's a small session, so only three things. The first thing is, how do they compete? The second thing is, how do they grow? Uh, and this is probably one of the most important because, as you see, in five years, they grow from zero to top. And that is, has been unseen in the world. And the last thing is, how do they operate? So let's start with the first thing. Uh, uh, anybody remembers uh, when you go to a business school and you go to a strategy, we tell you lots of models. In a strategy, most of them don't buy Porter. And then the first day, they tell you how do companies create value. And it's a model from Porte. Anybody remembers which model was this one? Value chain? Yes, you got it. <laughs> value chain, perfect. And then after that, the five forces and so on. No, you all remember that. Uh, value chain is a good way to depict how <laughs> companies create value. Uh, companies provide, have a provision of things, they transform these things. And they do marketing and sales, they do service, and well, they have support activities that are displayed at that. And this has been working for years and years and years in many companies. Well, uh, platforms don't operate this way. I mean, th they don't have an inventory. They don't procure anything. They don't have any goods, but they create value. So it's a model that doesn't work. And this is our most fundamental model. Uh, let's see how companies operate a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. The first thing that we have to understand is that, well, the kind of product changed a lot. I mean, before we had books. Now we have digital books. And digital books means that production cost is zero. No, nope. <laughs> again, zero, many zeros. Reproduction cost is zero. Production is instantly. Reproduction is instantly. Availability is infinite. So it's a big difference. Same thing happened with records. Same thing happens with many other materials. 
cost of reproducing a song is zero on top, you pay the download. I mean, not in somebody else, you pay the download. But the same thing happens in many things. You may say, well, no, that's not all products are digital. We have products that are not digital. Come on, taking a taxi is not digital. Unless you are in a Star Trek, you cannot transport yourself from place A to B instantly. You have to take a cup. But look at the whole change, the whole experience of taking a taxi. There are many things you have to find it, you have to call, you have to wait, you have to pay. How many of these things can become digital? Well, finding a taxi is a digital thing. Now in your calling a taxi, it is a digital thing. Obviously, the right, it's not. You have to go with a physical device, but paying, it's also a digital thing. So many of the activities related to the product, many of the services related to the product have been digitalized. Again, with the zero, remember? Cost zero, cost of producing zero, everything is zero. Okay, so let's have some fun. Why don't you have some groups? And you find uh, one is more than one vast company and identify parts of the products or services that can be digitalized. You have 12 minutes. Come on, come on. So what did you find? Anybody can tell us? I don't know. You, you, you had a very nice idea about an avatar. Tell us. to queue up uh, at the, in the changing rooms because I know it's a hassle. Mm -hmm. and, and they will save my life because nothing, I always buy things and then I try at home and say, shit, that's <laughs> 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 not my sense. <laughs> Anybody who wants to say things, I think that maybe here you found something too? Sure, tell us. Uh, well, we talked about supermarkets, that you don't need to go there, but you can go online and then choose the product that you want and they, they will bring you uh, your what you bought at home mm -hmm. on the same day, so you save up time because of that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And who else? Maybe there you found something? No? Oh, yes. David, <laughs> please tell us. Yeah, so we look at fashion retailers and basically came up with the concept that you uh, don't actually buy at the physical store anymore. You just go there and try out different styles and then you can just order it online and they send it to your home. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who, who's next? Okay, wonderful. I didn't see you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we thought that personal identification could be digitalized with fingerprints or eye scans, for example, so mm -hmm. you don't need a passport anymore. That would be fantastic. So we found many, many areas where this is happening. Uh, how do platforms manage to leverage on these areas and scale uh, so fast and, and so well? One of the things is that they eliminate bottlenecks. Look at this simple example. Uh, how do you do to publish a book? You send the book to the editor, and then what happens with the editor? Well, the books get piled, nobody reads them, and they are there. You wait, and maybe you're lucky, and then the editor reads your book. Maybe you are more lucky, and then the editor likes your book, and then gets published. Uh, what happens in Kindle, in Amazon Kindle? You just put it there and publish. Who decides if the book is good or not? The readers. They buy it or not. They decide with the pockets. This is a way to eliminate um, bottlenecks. You try to minimize friction. You fight against friction. Another case, another thing that platforms do is mobilize existing supply. We know that. I mean. Uh, the apartments of Airbnb are not Airbnb apartments, and somebody else, they mobilize the supply, and so on. Same thing happens to, with Uber. That's very common. And this is pretty an interesting thing. In innovation, normally in companies, you put projects inside the company, or you take projects from outside the company and you put them inside if you work in open innovation. But how can you manage innovation in a platform where you don't own it? The, the, the process, you cannot put any process there. Uh, you don't have any agency to the people because the people are not your employees. You cannot do anything. So the only thing that you can do is try to push uh, the incentives of them and the motivations 
of the third parties that are working for you. This is the case of Airbnb. Uh, this is probably the simple case. Look, what happens if you have an apartment in Airbnb and you are in page 28? Did you rent the apartment? No one will see it. No one will see it. Either you are in page one or two, or nobody sees your apartment. So this is a way to mobilize innovation. How do you do? Well, in the case of Airbnb, it's a simple ranking. And then in this simple ranking, you create competition, competition among the parties. And with this competition, you can put some guidelines and you can put some incentives. And then you push the incentives and the motivations of these uh, parties. And this is how you manage innovation. Completely different. Nothing to do with the way that you manage innovation in a normal, country, in a normal company. Absolutely different. So at the end of the day, platforms invert a company. And they work in a completely different way that normal companies do. In normal companies, the IT is about ERPs and CRMs and so on. And then in platforms, it's about experiments, A-B testing, all these kind of things. To play chain, it's about managing your stuff. In platforms, it's managing somebody else's stuff. And the third thing, probably the most interesting thing, is that you start a generative process inside the third parties in order to mobilize the innovation and the incentives and motivations that these third parties can have, either through rankings, either through contests, either through whatever you can imagine. And this is probably one of the most interesting things, because imagine how powerful this can be if you have a large ecosystem. Uh, just remember what happens with apps. How much innovation do we have in any app platform? Because the, the ecosystem is huge. The competition is large, and then you can have lots and lots of innovation. Uh, let's go for the more interesting stuff, uh, how platforms grow. Uh, let me introduce that with a simple example. <coughs> and this is, well, WhatsApp. You know WhatsApp, no? Well, WhatsApp, at uh, the moment that was acquired by Facebook, uh, was acquired by 16 billion. And this acquisition, well, these were the two guys, and Coleman. We are an actor, and this is the motto of WhatsApp, and so on. And this acquisition can be dealt in four numbers. So let's talk a little bit about these four numbers. The first one is 450. Uh, any idea of what was 450 when it was acquired by Facebook? You know it. Millions of users. How many users do they have now? 700, 800 million. Yep. That's about it. 32, well, this was millions of users. Great. <laughs> uh, 32. What was 32? Uh -huh. Number of employers. In fact, they, they were 16, but it was of the IPO and so on, and being acquired, they enlarged to 32. <laughs> and that means 14 million active users per, per employee, 50 million messages with an uptime of 99.9, .9, the best uptime in, in the industry. <laughs> uh, the other one is WANT. This one doesn't exist anymore, but at the point you remember, it is a little bit tricky. It, how much it cost in the Android platform? Now it's free. It costs $1 for a time in the Android platform and so on. Uh, the interesting one is zero. This is the most interesting one, and this is the one that I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, what does zero mean? Mm, yeah, that too, but it's not very new. Please. They spend in marketing zero. They didn't even have a PR people. Nobody. They used the PR people from Facebook. It was nobody. Absolutely nobody. Zero marketing. And this is common in most of platforms. This is very, very common. How can a company without marketing, without PR, grow that fast and be acquired with such more money and, and, and be so important? That's the interesting thing. And uh, this is about uh, a different mechanism than normal companies. Uh, anybody can imagine the toughest sell in the world. Imagine that you are a salesman. What would be the most challenging sell of any salesman in humanity? Anybody can guess. If we had to give a price about the most difficult sell ever, it's a bit of a joke, but well. <laughs> Of course, saving the first phone is the most difficult sell because 
what is the utility of the first form? <laughs> it has no utility. There is no utility. It's useless. Who wants to buy a first form? Nobody. So, well, things change when you have two. At least you can molest somebody all day long. That's, that's something. And things change more when you have many, and then you can molest more people. <laughs> you can talk all day long to more people. Uh, just look at one thing. Did the phone change in any aspect? No, it didn't. It's the same phone. It's like WhatsApp. Did you change a line of code because you have one user or 400 mil 450 million users? No. It's the same WhatsApp. So the product is exactly the same. But the value of the product for people is completely different. It's completely different the value of the product when you have one phone than when the phone has uh, hundreds of millions or whatever other phones. This is network effects, and this is direct network effects. Uh, we see that in many, many products. We see that in WhatsApp, in phones, in Microsoft Office, and so on. And this is probably one of the most powerful forces that carry growth in all these platforms and in general in digital products. Because network effects make increase the value. And because they increase the value, well, you acquire it. You buy it. It's a completely different mechanism. You don't have to do any marketing or PR and so on. As long as people are aware of that, well, you have a, something that has huge value. Not because of what you do. Because of many users use it. What you do is the same when you have one user that one you, you have 450 million users. Same product. You don't change a line of code. It's because of the users. Uh, let's <coughs> try to think a little bit about how can we put a cap in this value. I mean, you know, in business, in general, we try to, uh, well, have a number for everything <laughs> and try to know, well, how much is this value? We talk, well, it has more and more, much more value and so on. What could be the, this, this cap? And then, well, if the value increases to the number of users, then the number of combinations and connections that you can make, this could be the top, the cap of the value. And what is the number of connections and a square being and the number of users? Okay? So that would be the, the top. If we have a product that has no friction, that is absolutely easy to use and so on, this would be the top value. By the way, this WhatsApp has friction? No. You download, that's it. It's easy to do, yeah, in the square. And this is an important part. Uh, what happens? Well, there is a critical mass, critical point here, that <coughs> when you cross this point, what is happening is that, well, all your efforts, the, the value of the product grows faster than your efforts to promote the product. And here, you have to push a lot. And you have this feeling that, well, it costs a lot to push this product and so on. But at the point, takes over. And then the, the product goes fast, very, goes very high, very far, very fast. So that's a, a critical mass. You see that when you are in a startup in a picture like this. You keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and never happens. And suddenly, one day, uh, the product pushes you. <laughs> you don't have to do anything. And that's why you don't use marketing or PR or anything, because the product goes. The value is the product is so high in comparison with the efforts that you need that it goes very, very fast. By the way, if the product is completely digital, <coughs> how much cost do you have? This cost is increasing, decreasing, it's big, it's, it's high, it's low. What happens when the product is completely digital and we digitalize everything? Is this going in this direction? Or it goes in this direction. Which direction it goes? If we sell normal phones, physical product, well, it will go in this direction, no? The cost is still high, and instead of starting here, well, we'll start here because you will need an investment, an initial investment, blah, 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 blah. But if everything is digital, what happens to this line? It goes here, no? And uh, as time passes, uh, digital products or putting things into digital using platforms increase in cost or decrease? It's more or less costly nowadays to put things in a platform like Amazon Web Services in the cloud. Decrease, no? 
Well, in general, in computing, the, the answer to each question is always lower. <laughs> if time passes, computers cost lower, and uh, storage costs lower, and uh, process, processing power costs lower, and so on. So we are in a scenario with this, is going more in this direction. Uh, compare that to the typical business. How do you manage a typical business? Well, you make a marketing campaign, and you create awareness. Hopefully, you raise some interest. And then maybe somebody evaluates your product, and somebody likes it and commits to buy your product. And after that, you have some referrals, and finally, you, they buy it. Absolutely different, no? The amount of money that you need to convince this small number of people is large. The noise that you have to do is big. It's a big effort compared to network effects. Uh, we have been talking about uh, direct network effects. Direct network effects is, well, you have a product, and then this product increases the value because you have more users. That's wonderful. We have another kind of network effects that is indirect network effects, side network effects. You know that. One good example is Google. Do you increase the value for yourself of Google if, we, if million people are Googling something? Well, the value doesn't increase for you. For whom increases the value? when million people are Googling something. Not for you, for him. For Google, no? For the advertisers. So instead of increasing the value for the same site, increase the value to another site. Hmm? This is also a network effect. It's powerful and so on. But we have to remember that it increases not the value for you, but for somebody else. If we want to put value here, we have to transform it. We have to monetize it, transform this monetization in a better platform, and through a better platform, increase the value here. So it's a process. In this process, we can be wrong or we can be right. We can make a wonderful platform that increases a lot of value, or we can make a platform that decreases the value because the one before was better. Got it? So it's always, well, that's the case of Google. That is for investors. You have these cross-site network effects in many in games, in many things. So we can look at that from the point of view of the ecosystem. Because network effects are not only for a single company. We have network effects if you are a mobile phone with, for the handset, for the operators, and all these participate in the game. So it's not close to one single ecosystem, but also to the whole game. Let's talk a little bit about that. Now we know the basics, so let's go a little bit. Let's take an example. For example, Facebook. Let's find network effects in Facebook. Anybody who can tell me a direct network effect in Facebook of this kind? If we have more users, does the value increase for you? More users, this will be direct. Implies that we have more value for the users because you can talk to your friends and so on. More direct. What happens if we have more users? Yeah. Yeah, that would be direct or indirect? Indirect. So let's put it here. More users means more value for brands. And then if we are able to monetize this value for brands, we can make a better platform. If not, not. We will have some, some, some money. More network effects, yes. More users means more revenue. Yes. And? Well, that could be indirect too. More users. More data, more opportunity for, for personalization, and so on and so forth. Please. Uh-huh. This is direct or indirect? More users, more content. To whom do it benefit? It benefit uh, OK. So direct. Hmm? If it benefits to yourself, it's direct. If it benefits somebody else, then it's indirect. Then uh, this is a very powerful one. Good, good point. This is also a very, very powerful one. That is more users, more content. So <laughs> you are 
more eager to go to the platform because there is more content there. Hmm? Yes. Well, yeah. No one. Yes. More uses, more apps. Great. This is a very powerful one, too. More. Anybody plays Tinker or FarmView? Nobody has done that, never ever. No. Here, no. Nobody has been playing FarmView or any of the games of Tinker in Facebook. <laughs> Do you play games with Facebook or not? Nobody? Come on. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> yes. Yes. OK. Uh, let's put the games first. More users, more games. <coughs> then more users, more apps. That means interconnection, and so on. Uh, more. What about fan pages? Do you know fan pages in Facebook? OK. It's direct or indirect? Mm -hmm. Because? OK. More fan pages. So we have more indirect. But also it benefits the users too, no? Mm, because, well, you are eager to see your fan and so on. Mm? So sometimes you have a network effect that is both. The benefits on one side, of course, the advertisement, but also the users. It doesn't happen often, but sometimes it happens. More fan pages or more value for users. What else? Yes. Uh huh. Would be direct or indirect? Direct. Well, it's like content, no? It's a type of content. Yeah, yeah. More users, more videos, more news, more whatever. Hmm? It would be. A kind of indirect. So now you know the game. I, it's not about having one network effect or two network effects, but how, how many did we find here? Quite a lot, no? And probably if we continue, we're going to find more because there are more constituencies than there are developers, there are God knows what. So it's about finding many of them. What do you do once you have all of them? What do you think it's a game? What do you th Imagine that you were Facebook. Uh, you know that. So what will you do? What is your job here? Yes. Sure. I mean, uh, try to monetize, try to create value from all this, and so on. This is one. But imagine that you want to grow. What would be your analysis? Absolutely. It's better to lure the developers and do a developer convention than God knows what. It's better to put the money into creating a better way to make apps and easier so we have more developers. Or it's better to go for games and then try to make a game convention for Facebook so we have lots of games and so on. And with these lots of games, we have lots of users and make competitions and prizes. So it's better. This is one thing. What else? What else could be interesting? Do you think it's going to be sometimes conflicts between these network effects? Yeah. So what do you want to do with conflicts? Mm -hmm. You have to put some rules and so on, some governance in the whole thing. At the end, you have to try to minimize the conflicts and most important, align these network effects in the same direction so they reinforce one to each other instead of fighting against them. So you grow faster. So that's a game. Do you think it's easy to invent more network effects? Yeah, you invent a new constituency and you have more network effects. I don't know. Let's go for moms, moms doing pies. Uh, beat is moms doing pies, so more uses more. <laughs> then you create a special page for beating moms uh, doing pies, and then you will have an you know, indirect network effects that will appeal to a certain constituency. In this case, beat is moms doing pies, or whatever you want to invent. 
and so on. You can invent many of these networks. Like the game is, which one do I invent? What do I put my money in? How to minimize the conflicts? How do I align all of these network effects in the same direction so they reinforce each other? So let's do a simple exercise. <coughs> and then let's try to find uh, some network effects. In one of these companies, you have an example that is Facebook. Well, find another one. Facebook not, we did Facebook. <laughs> find another one. <laughs> we have 40 minutes. Wikipedia. OK, direct network effects. What do we have? Yes, 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 yes. More users, more content. Uh-huh. More users, more content. Let's go one by one. So more content is more interesting for users, so you look more at Wikipedia because, come on, you find everything there. And more users, more edits, more collections, and so on. So it means more quality. And then you look at Wikipedia because you trust Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, indirect. What did you find? More users. You create more awareness. You create more recognition. And that means more opportunities for uh, donations. Yes, funding. Funding. You need money at the end of the day. <laughs> what else? Mm -hmm. So that, that is, uh, well, we can also put that, well, this is, this is. Uh, let's just start this discussion. This discussion is very interesting. As you can see, as she points out, uh, Wikipedia has tremendous opportunities for growth. Compare that with Facebook, that now is trying to become a bank, or that have games and have platforms for everything and so on. And you may ask yourselves, why on earth Wikipedia uh, doesn't take advantage of all these opportunities that are there? What do you think? Why they don't do that? Oh, that's one thing. Focus. What else? By focusing as a nonprofit, you can just demonstrate the, the content that you can see and it's clear of all bias and third parties. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, the mission is fulfilled and the mission is not to dominate the world. It's to, buy, to provide the best content possible for encyclopedia. It's a different mission. And that's, uh, we can see that a lot. With nonprofits, you, you, you compare nonprofits for, for profit organizations, you see that a lot. Nonprofits, you find things like that. And they stop here. They fulfill the mission and they try to do the best of they can with this mission. When you go for profits, well, opportunities are immense and they try to, well, dominate the world if they can. Facebook now uh, bought a license for being a bank and is uh, uh, entering payments. And if you go to the equivalent in China, you see that um, you have Alipay, and Alipay is extremely popular. You have many, many things in Alipay, and everybody uses it. So it's a big difference. Mm? And the opportunities that you could have here to put more constituencies, monetize it, and so on, they don't take it. But it's because of the mission. Let's move on. <coughs> uh, this is interesting. But there are more interesting things in platforms. Uh, things don't stop in uh, how they grow. As interesting as it is. Uh, how platforms operate, this is the most interesting, for me, it's the most interesting thing. Let's look at the simple, <coughs> at the simple way to, to work in a non-platform way. Let's imagine that we want to find a taxi. How do we find a taxi? Well, normally you raise your hand and you have lots of taxis going on in the center. Hopefully, you catch one and they see you and then you stop a taxi. And what is that at the end of the day? Well, it's a matching process between people who want a taxi and taxis. That's the matching process. Uh, matching processes are interesting. Does it work perfectly? Not always. You have many times lots of taxis and nobody. <laughs> you have, uh, and that it's a common phenomenon. But you also have lots of people asking for taxis and no taxis at all. I mean, this image probably sounds familiar to all of you. We all have been living that. Is there a better way? Yeah, there is one. We, we, we know how to do the matching in a better way. I mean, Uber invented this matching in a better way. You have an interface, you ask for a taxi, and then the taxi knows, less downtime, less everything, and so on. And then this better way has been copied not only by Uber, but by many, by many companies that use the same interface to deal 
either with platforms or with existing touchings or whatever. And you have it even in the, in the watch. So you, it's very popular and you have it. Uh, let's think about one second. What is the big problem we being solved here? This is an important problem. Uh, what type of problem are we solving here doing this thing? Yes? Yeah. Uh, Supply, and demand. Supply and demand. That's the way that we look at uh, resources in a free market, how do efficiently allocate resources? What is our mechanism to efficiently allocate resources in a market? Let's remember economy. Yes? Could you turn that information on so people see before uh, earlier there was a, a line with people waiting to press, mm -hmm. but maybe I can speed up the way and that's why you seem to be ahead. Uh, many, many steps available. Mm -hmm. Could you know that? Sure. Line? Sure, it's about information and so on. Uh, Let's go more in this direction, if you don't mind. Uh, in a free market, uh, you, we have a mechanism for allocating resources. No? Uh, what is this mechanism? You remember economy. Well, it's a market. No? What is the big problem that the market solves? Coordination. Hmm? The market finds an effective way to efficiently coordinate the people who want taxis and taxi drivers, so the people who want to buy bread and the bread producers and so on. Remember, uh, <laughs> I, I know that you know the anecdote and so on. One of the conversations between uh, <laughs> the first conversations during the Cold War between Khrushchev and the, and the ones, uh, and an American president that says, well, I'm amazed that you have bread all day long and so on, and nobody <laughs> is coordinating that and is asking how much bread do you have to produce and so on, and it's produced everywhere. And it's produced very well and punctually and so on. That's the wonderful thing of the market. Uh, do you think this is an important problem or not, this uh, problem of the coordination, finding a coordination mechanism? Well, it's having markets. It's the cornerstone of what we do in economy. At the end, uh, the market is the way that we solve any economic problem. We create a market. And uh, we solve that through coordinating things. So this is the drivers and riders in Uber and so on. Uh, let's think about what happened with the coordination. Markets coordinate in very different ways. One way, Middle Ages, you have a building or you have a district, and then everybody goes there to buy things. And you know that a certain hour, producers will be there, buyers will be there, and then coordination happens. In your more modern times, you are in NASDAQ, and then you uh, are affiliated or belong to NASCAR. And then because of that, then you know that the ones who <coughs> want to sell shares and the ones who want to buy shares both belong to NASCAR, and they, they can trade into NASCAR. And this is a way to match, to match them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to sell cars, you create dealers, and then you go to dealers, and this is a way to match. And you always create, you institutionalize uh, mechanisms. Sometimes it's physical mechanisms, sometimes it's not physical mechanisms, in order to produce this coordination. What is the coordination here? Price. Hmm? Price. No, but uh, the coordination, the mechanism to, to coordinate is price, obviously. Uh, price is the big invention of a market. It's a monetary unit that you can value anything at the same level. So this is the, the, the way. But uh, where is the coordination in these things? Let's look for a second. Compare two organizations, a typical organization and a platform. Uh, do you know Magnum? Magnum is, has been the, the most well-known agency for photos in the 20th century. And Magnum has produced outstanding photos like this. And they hire photographs, photo, and then they sell the photos to newspapers, to magazines, and so on. And you have incredible photos in Magnum. Uh, nowadays, uh, this is no longer the way. Nowadays, you go to platforms like 500 Peaks, or you are so as I am to Flickr. <laughs> You are young, you don't go to Flickr. <laughs> but if you are <laughs> nobody like me, then you go, <laughs> still go to Flickr. <laughs> okay? And then you find here. <laughs> how this works and how this works? Well, this used to work this way. You have a ton of people, some of them that are salesmen, that go out there and then try to find clients and then try to find uh, clients in newspapers, in journals, in magazines, in whatever, that want photos and sell it. And also people that purchase things and try to find the best photographs, the best uh, reporters, the best everything, and they can bring here. Where is that in Flickr? What did you put? 
all this work that all these people do. Where is it? Hmm? The user does it. But I mean, you have a part that, that creates it. Where did we put it? It's not people. It's software. We put it in software. Well, this has huge implications. Because the work of all these people now is done by software. And this is a pretty generic work. It's a cornerstone of any uh, economy. It's a market. We have markets, coordination mechanisms put in software. This is the case of Uber with drivers and riders, of Airbnb with homeowners and tourists, and so on. What is the cost of making this coordination happen in the case that you put it in software? We have a matching number today. Remember the matching number? Yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> this was the matching number. <laughs> It's zero. Well, uh, you may say, no, nah, come on, it's not zero, because you have to program it, you have to make the platform, you have to do all these things. OK, let's, let's use proper language, and the cost is not zero. The proper language will be the marginal, uh, the marginal cost of this coordination will be close to zero. This will be proper, proper language. Okay. Uh, what happens with the fixed costs? Are they increasing or decreasing the cost of making the platform? Um? Decreasing, mm -hmm. like everything in software. Mm -hmm. Costs are decreasing and so on. You have more and more platforms available, platforms like Amazon Web Services, like Microsoft Azure, and so on, where you can put all these things. It's not as difficult as it was 10 years ago. And in 10 years, it will be easier than it is now, obviously. <coughs> so and also, does it scale a lot or not? Does it scale well or not? If we want to go from 1 million users to 50 million users to 500 million users, can we do it? Yeah. Wow, it's like magic. First time in this history, you know? We get value in such a generic form that is making a market with total scalability. Never happened before. It's first time in history. Uh, let's go further and let's progress. Uh, how many of you use Netflix? Yeah, me too. <laughs> So in Netflix, you have more things. It's, of course, you have coordination, obviously, no? But, but you have more things. One thing that you have is recommendations, no? I mean, <laughs> things that because you watch Travelers, then you have to watch 12 Monkeys. I watch it. <laughs> the Expanse, I didn't, and so on. And because you watch this nasty, you have to watch it, whatever, hmm? and so on. All these are recommendations. Recommendations is coordination, not really. It's a different thing. Uh, you recommend something, you know the taste, you have learned the taste of somebody, and then on what you have learned, you try to put different coordination, different uh, uh, preferences, and you have to put this preference in, in working for, for, for the people. So it's not coordination. Uh, uh, look at this. We don't have only coordination. We can put business rules. We can put organizational circuits. We can put aggregational process, and so on. And we do that. Uh, many, many times, not only in platforms, but also in software like ERPs and so on. What happens when we do that? How is the fidelity or the replication of the propagation? It's instant. And if you have been working with salespeople, for example, I've been working in sales quite a lot in, in my life and in computers and so on. And well, if you have a new policy, you say, well, now discounts are going to be 10% less. If discounts are going to be 10% more, then propagation is instant. No problem. <laughs> but if discounts are going to be 10% less, do you think it's instant? No. Oh, you know, my client, it's so special. We cannot apply to him. Because such a special client, such an important client. This sounds familiar. Well, if you work in sales, this will sound very, very, very familiar to all of you. It's what happens all the time. In this case of platforms, fidelity is complete. Propagation is instant. So it's a completely different case. Uh, I want to convince you that we are in the beginning of something and not at the end of something. And this is a video of five years ago. All this technology is completely obsolete. But look at it. hosted by a member of our Jeopardy! Clue Crew, 
Please welcome Jimmy McGuire. Gentlemen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. What do you say we play Jeopardy? All right, Let's all right. get right into the Jeopardy round. These categories, a man, a plane, a canal, Erie, Chicks Dig Me, children's book titles, My Michelle, MC5, and finally, vocabulary. Ken, you're in the first position. Please make a selection. Oh, I've never said this on TV. Chicks Dig Me for 200, please, Jimmy. <laughs> Kathleen Kenyon's excavation of this city mentioned in Joshua showed the walls had been repaired 17 times. Watson. What is Jericho? Correct. 400, same category. This mystery author and her archaeologist hubby dug in hopes of finding the lost Syrian city of Urkesh. Watson. Who is Agatha Christie? Correct. Same category, 600. At the Old Divide Gorge in 1959, she and hubby Lewis found a 1.75 million year old Australopithecus Boise-eyed skull. Watson. Who is Mary Leakey? You're right. 800, same category. Harriet Boyd Hawes was the first woman to discover and excavate a Minoan settlement on this island. Watson. What is Crete? Yes. Let's finish Chicks Dig Me. <laughs> at, Mount, at Mount Carmel in Israel, Dorothy Garad was the first to find this prehistoric human skeleton outside of Europe. Ken. What is Neanderthal? You're right. Let's go to children's books titles for 200. Marjorie Williams' story of a stuffed toy that comes to life, the blank rabbit. Brad. What is Velveteen? You're right. Um, MC5 for 200, please. He's worth every penny as Alfred Pennyworth in The Dark Knight. Brad again. Who, who is Michael Caine? You're right. Uh, MC5 for, let's jump down to 800, please. Edgar Degas' style influenced that of this female American impressionist. Brad. Who is Mary Cassatt? Correct. And MC5 for 1,000. The film Gigi gave him his signature song, Thank Heaven for Little Girls. Watson. Who is Maurice Chevalier? Correct. Same category, 400. The parents of this 52nd governor of New York immigrated to the United States from Salerno, Italy. Watson. Who is Mario Cuomo? Correct. Let's finish MC5. This child star got his first on-screen kiss in My Girl. Ken? Who's Macaulay Culkin? Correct. Uh, children's book titles, 400. By Judith Bjorst, Alexander and the Terrible, Terrible, No Good, Blank, Blank Day. Ken? What is very bad? Correct. Book title, 600. By Dr. Seuss, The Blank Hats of Bartholomew Cubbins. Ken again. What is 500? You're right. Uh, book title's 800. By Maurice Sendak, in the blank kitchen. Ken? What is night? Correct. Book title's 1,000. A classic by Crockett Johnson, Harold and the blank crayon. Watson. What is purple? Correct. Taking you to 4,400 and taking us to our first break. We hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. We'll be right back after this. So that was five years ago. The technology is completely obsolete in disease ontologies, now we can do much better, way much better than this. But uh, you see the power that is behind. I mean, the power is in self-driving cars and so on. You may think that this is a very complicated and sophisticated thing. Let's look at some problems. Uh, one of the things that we know how to do in artificial intelligence, for example, is classification. Uh, why is classification so easy? Well, because you don't have to understand the world. You only have to know that it's different. That's it. You don't have to know what it is. Yes, what is different. That's why classification is not that complicated. You don't have to know that the human is a human and a car is a, is, is a car. You only have to know that, well, it's not the same. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a different thing. Uh, uh, do you think that classification leads around many of the problems that we have? I don't know. Think of a, of a think of house doctor. Uh, medicine doctor and so on, what they do when you go there? They tell you, well, take an ibuprofen, go to the specialist, or, yeah, you don't have anything, go somebody else. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, is this not a classification problem? You bet it is. It's a classification problem. If you go to a lawyer for 
simple matter and so on. What do you have there? Same thing. Well, no way you're going to win this or go to the specialist because this is going to know so this is a very well known thing. You have to do ABC and so on. Oh, forget it. <laughs> forget it. <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to. It's not going to fly. It's again a classification problem. How many classification problems do we have? Lots. Is this applying a big constituencies? No. They're pretty big, no, and solving big problems. So these are the things that we can put. And these are the things that we can put in software. Until now, we have put in coordination in software, a little bit of aggregation process, recommendation, and so on. Uh, classification is not, not there yet, but it's coming. It will be coming. Imagine the new things that we can put there. Again, instant deployment, propagation, replication, fidelity, and so on. And uh, now we can do things like that, much more complex than uh, a machine who plays Jeopardy and understands natural language and can answer and knows the correct answer for everything. And the same thing is going to create lots of value. I mean, tons of value. Imagine how much value you create with uh, doctors classificating things and so on. Well, what is going to be the cost of creating value for the platforms that do that? Our magical number was? Yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so remember two things only today, and there are two important things that we did. I mean, the first important thing is how platforms grow. Platforms will grow, the, like the business model that you may know, the Canvas and so on. Platforms is a different game. It's about network effects. The game is which one do I incentivize, how I monetize it, and <coughs> how do I align all of them so the feedback loops reinforce each other. That's, that's the first game. The second thing that we learned today is that platforms put functions in software, put generic functions in software. By doing that, they create huge scalability at zero cost, creating huge amounts of value. What you do with the value, it's business of the platform. Maybe you have Wikipedia and you give the value away and people don't have to pay anything for having the best encyclopedia of, of the world. Or maybe you monetize only in part and uh, you use that for making and pushing the platform to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow faster and faster and faster. You have Facebook or whatever or WhatsApp. Or maybe you try to monetize in part and you sacrifice go. That's the business of the platform. But this is the result of putting functions in software at zero cost in huge scalability. Thank you so much.